Welcome back, volleyball fans, Summit League fans. We are exactly halfway through the season. Um, at the end of this weekend, we'll be halfway through. So it is week five, week five of nine. I actually kind of can't believe it. And I also kind of can't believe the standings right now. A few things that look pretty normal and a, a lot more than a few things that look not how I expected them. Um, but then again, I'm just a girl with a microphone. So take what I say with a grain of salt. Take it, like, please take what I say, but also take it with a grain of salt. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, so it's a three-match week for everyone except for Kansas City, USD, and Denver. So we are going to recap last Saturday's matches and then Tuesday's matches two days ago. And then there are matches tonight and Saturday that we will preview for you. So I feel like I saw some really great things from some of the teams who are at the bottom of the league. Um, so I'm going to start with them. So St. Thomas had um, an absolutely monster reverse sweep over North Dakota State on Saturday. Um, did not see that coming. So the first set, 30 to 28 in favor of NDSU. There were literally 58 points <laughs> played and scored um, in just the first set. They, I mean, that's like – it. I don't know, a set and a half, essentially. Um, so that was kind of crazy. It was a, a monster start. We knew it was going to be good from that moment after, you know, seeing the first set. Um, it was just so much fun to watch. I feel like St. Thomas, I know they're building a new facility for basketball and hockey, presumably volleyball um, as well. I guess I don't know that for a fact, but I also don't know why they wouldn't just move everything over there. That being said, Schenecker's small. It's nice and tight. Um, you know, it's it, if you're on the court, it feels like everyone's on top of you. Um, so it was it seemed like a good environment um, coming from the TV. So I wish that I had been there. I think that that would have been super fun. Um, Tazo Rizidis had 16 kills and five blocks in that match. And Ellie Gustafson, 13 kills and 15 digs. Again, I want to remind you, this is quite literally a roster with 15 underclassmen. Like 15 of their 20 roster spots are freshmen or sophomore. Also, the injury to Emma Gerger, who has been a leader for them. Um, they do have Keeley back now, as far as I know, but she was injured for a while as well. Um, they're also still in their transition to Division One. And actually, I did not – it makes sense because they've been in the league for three years now, but I hadn't done the math. So we're going to talk to Coach Ting Pham later today, and you'll get to hear from him about that transition and, and the patience that it requires. But he reminded me that they've not yet graduated a Division One class. It's only been three years. Um, so for them to be reverse sweeping teams like North Dakota State and, you know, challenging um, teams like Omaha and whoever else that are at the top of our league – pretty incredible pretty incredible so the record is not that pretty but that's you know not what they're concerned with right now I'm excited for you to get to hear from um coach fam and hear kind of his insights and how he feels that things are going later on today um yeah but I just want to tell you now that St. Thomas is like somebody to look out for. I don't feel like this is a team that other teams in the league are taking for granted and if they are they certainly should not be. So we are going to move on to Oral Roberts. ORU is one and six. They did not play on Saturday. So we're going to actually go back to last Thursday when they played South Dakota State. Um, they dropped that one um, in four sets. That one was really weird. It was kind of wonky. It felt like um, my brain's a little foggy because that was a week ago. And I've watched just so much volleyball, including outside the Summit League as well since then. Um, but the way it ended, uh, it ended on a net violation. And to be honest with you, like, I would have to go back and watch the replay. But it was really weird. ORU did not seem to think that they were in the net um, at all. And I don't know if it was like a foot over the line situation underneath the net. I'm not sure. But it was really weird. They did not seem to think they were in the net, um, and it just ended. They had a lot of momentum. They were rallying, um, probably about to push South Dakota State to five sets. I mean, we can't say that for sure, but it seemed like they were th – th that's the direction they were heading. 
during that match, it felt like there were more challenges than normal. I mean, you only get two unless you win, you know, then you get to keep them. But it just, I don't know. They were really pushing SCSU. Dan George Ellis is pretty fired up. I don't know that I've seen him that fired up um, in a long time, if ever. Um, it just, it was weird. I don't know. Something was in the air. I didn't like the way it ended. That said, that's how that ended. Um, the first three sets, oh, that's the other thing. The first three sets were 25 to 21, all three of them, the same score. Um, so that was weird. And then SCSU eventually won 25 to 23 in the fourth set on that net violation. So um, in that match, Trinity Freeman, 16 kills, excuse me, 16 digs, nine kills, four aces just continues to lead this team into battle. Trinity Freeman's such a rock star. I absolutely love to watch her play. Um, she kind of breathes life into that team. I feel like we haven't talked a lot about Kedrin Burke, but she totaled 14 blocks over their last two matches, 14 timely blocks. If you ask me, I think that um, her presence at the net during this last little stretch, the last couple of weeks has really been something that's helped ORU get into those rally situations and really start to push some teams. Um, so yeah, there you have it. Trinity Freeman and Kedron Burke leaders for ORU in the Tuesday match with Omaha. Um, again, we go 30 to 28. That's our second 30 point match. Um, 58 point match, whatever, I guess this, this week, um, between Omaha and ORU. Omaha did win that first set. ORU took the second, 26 to 24, and then Omaha won three and four by a score of 25 to 22. So I tell you this because in the same way that I talk about St. Thomas, you guys know me, you know, I like to mostly be positive and like be an advocate for everyone and like all the sappy shit. Yes, that's true. That's accurate. However, I tell you this, I give you these box scores because it's important for you to know that while ORU's record is not pretty, they're taking teams like Omaha, top of the league Omaha, who's won eight straight in a row, Omaha to 30 point sets, 26 point sets, whatever be like they pushed Omaha to extra points two sets in a row and ended up winning the second set. So I just think it's important to remember that it's easy to kind of put down these teams that are not doing so well and kind of forget about them. But when you do that, they come back and surprise you just like St. Thomas reverse sweeping North Dakota State. So I don't think either of these teams are teams to sleep on. Um, I'm hoping to get ORU coach Luke Ward on the show here in the next couple of weeks. I'd love to chat with him about his first season and just like the good things that he's seeing. Um, so hopefully we can do that. Um, oh, my gosh, I wrote a joke and I forgot to tell it. Oops. Um, I was going to say, like when I was talking about that, I put in my notes, you can't judge the caliber of a team by their record unless they're Michigan. Just kidding, but not really. Anyway, moving on. Um, since we are kind of talking about Omaha, we will jump there next. Omaha is eight and one. As I said, eight wins in a row. They lost their first match of the conference slate and have not lost since. Very reminiscent of South Dakota from last year and their big winning streaks. Um, I didn't put specific stats in like a banner for you to see because I just I just want to talk about Omaha. Eight wins is an ungodly number. <laughs> like that's a lot of wins in a row. I think at two different points in the season last year, South Dakota had 13, like 11 or 13, um, which is cr even crazier. That's video game numbers. Um, but Omaha seems to very much be like a win by committee team this year. That's a phrase that, you, you know, we heard Jesse Tupac use in his interview with me uh, last week or the, the week prior. I think there are a few teams in the league like that. North Dakota being one of them, North Dakota State, definitely Kansas City and also Omaha. The other teams in the league kind of have these, you know, breakout standout stars that tend to take control. I don't think Omaha really has that. Maybe a little bit in Shayla McCormick, but then we often see like a Rachel Fairbanks or McKenna Ruck or whoever the heck else, Erica Fava, joining in there. Um, McCormick and Fairbanks both had double doubles in kills and digs um, this this past week uh, against I think against ORU. And also, I thought this is funny. I was watching the games the other night, and my husband was like, "Why does that kid have a sign that with a spice bottle?" 
and I was like, what are you talking about? Like, I never saw, I never saw the sign on TV. I just, my husband was just telling me about it because he, he caught it. And he was like, yeah, it's like a spice bottle and it says McCormick on it. Like, like McCormick spices that you would find at the store. And I was like, oh my God, because Shayla McCormick. So somebody, a student at Omaha made a sign. I don't know if it was a specific spice because I didn't see it. I would love to see it. So um, Omaha fans, if you have a picture of that or can get one, send it to me, post it on Twitter. I would love to see it. Um, But I thought that was funny. So as someone who made a sign for Luke Apple that said, fear the fruit in grad school, we also, what was the other one we made? Oh, for Douglas Wilson, we, we made a sign with a volleyball on it. And we just put Wilson. So if you don't get that joke, um, you're too young. Look it up. I actually probably shouldn't even understand the reference that I just made, but we watch Castaway in psychology in high school. And that's the only reason that I know that. So, but anyway, as someone who made some pretty punny signs, kudos to the McCormick Spices Omaha student. That is fantastic. Top tier top tier material there. Also, just in general, the Omaha student section has been killing it. Um, St. Thomas student section has been killing it. USD student section has been killing it. The rest of the students, I don't really get to see on the streams that I watch. Um, Maybe I'm just not paying good enough attention. I'll pay attention this week and see if I can see any, but those three definitely killing it. Okay. Let's talk SDSU and USD from this week. So SDSU is two and six. USD is five and three. Um, This is after after that match as of today. SDSU came out really hot and won the first two sets. And then USD was like, yeah, this is our court. You can go home now. Um, Really incredible match. I did not expect. I expected a good match. I didn't expect SDSU to win the first two sets. One of the first two sets, for sure, but not, like, the first two to go up to nothing. Um, Box score for that, 25-19, 26-24 to put SDSU up to nothing. Then 25-23, 25-14, 15-10. So this is where I just start to feel like SDSU maybe just ran out of gas a little. Um, I didn't watch the whole match because, obviously, there were other matches going on. And I also forgot that there was volleyball on Tuesday until, like, 5 o'clock on Tuesday, so... That's what PhD school will do to you. Um, But yeah, it just seemed like SDSU ran out of gas, but that's not to take anything away from um, USD. USD has rallied late so many times this season already. They've been in a good number of five set matches in the non-conference and in the conference season. Um, So it's certainly nothing new for them. They have the grit mentality, not questioning that or taking that away at all. But also like, I feel like that was winnable for SDSU. And that's another thing. And I can't remember if it was um, Coach Lopez or Coach Pham, because I talked to both of them this week, who said this, but the Summit League right now, seriously, anybody's game, every single match, like every single match, I literally, that's why I keep saying I have no idea what's going to happen. That's why my predictions are BS all the time. Like, I don't know. They're based on some level of like knowledge and investigation and examination of stats. But like, just because you base something on stats doesn't mean it's accurate. So anyway, I digress. I feel like that match was winnable um, for, for both teams. And it happened to be USD who had the most gas in them and was able to rally and stick together and, and pull together and win that. I personally wanted this win for SDSU for morale purposes because it's just not been a great season for them. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Also, since I've been like doing podcasts and kind of covering everyone, I Like, of course, I'm still biased. I still went to SDSU. My dad did. My grandpa did. My aunt did. Like, of course. But I don't really have, at least in basketball and volleyball, other sports maybe, but at least in, like, in this specific season, I don't really have the deep-rooted, like, hate. (laughs) I just don't anymore. I don't know. I think when you start getting into stats and when you start really watching for the love of the game – you like some of that goes away and you start to really see the talent. And when you talk to these coaches and players, which is like privilege that I can't even believe I have, and I'm grateful for it every day. Um, a lot of that starts to go away as well. So just my take, I don't get as pissy as I used to when SDSU loses. Um, anyways, in this match for SDSU, 
Sylvie's guns, literally unbelievable. Literally unbelievable. 26 kills, 11 digs. Sydney Shetnan had 11 blocks. And I just want to point out this match would not have been as close without Sydney Shetnan's defense at the net. Like it would not have been a winnable match without that. The impact that she's made on this team already is huge. Miraculous. Um, when SDSU played DU last week, we saw Riley Martin getting kind of like the primary center position. But then in the USD match, Coach George Alice decided to bring Reagan Riley back in and they kind of split it up, divide and conquer. Um, I think Reagan Riley ended up with 25 assists and uh, Riley Martin ended up with 24. So I'm not sure what's going on there. I can't wait to have Coach Dan George Alice on the show and ask him about it because I want to know. Um, He's not the only one to, I, and I, I was going to say he's not the only one to mess around with the 6-2. I don't think he's running a 6-2. I think he just like made the switch. Um, but I don't know. I would have to go back and watch. St. Thomas ran a 6-2 for a while, but I know they had that injury and that's why they um, made that shift back to the 5-1. So interesting. interesting. Um, all right. For the Yotes in this match, Madison Harms, as usual, 16 kills, 8 blocks. Kylan Seelock had 16 kills. Samantha Laird had 12 kills. She's a freshman, by the way. Um, Amanda Loxon had 7 blocks. And Bryn Palman had 6 blocks. Bryn Palman had 6 blocks, which was less than the other, than, than Amanda and Madison. However, those were 6 of the timeliest blocks I've ever seen in my life. Just, I don't know. Bryn Palman seems to show up at the net and save the day all the time and she's super fun to watch so before I forget a note about Madison Harms Madison Harms reached 600 blocks last week she is only the second player in Summit League history to ever do this um the first was Kathy Brinkworth I found that out by tweeting at the Summit League and telling them to tell me who the other person was um Kathy Brinkworth played for Buffalo from 1994 to 1997 Buffalo is not even in the league anymore they have not been in quite some time and if you need me to put that in perspective for you, at the end of the 1997 volleyball season, I was four months old. I am an August 97 baby. Um, I am now in a doctoral program. <laughs> so if you need a perspective on that, uh, I'm 26. I just turned 26. It has been 26 years since a summer league volleyball player was able to tally 600 blocks and we are halfway through the season with a, potentially a postseason um for Madison Harms so that's an absolutely incredible feat this is a generational type volleyball player that y'all are getting the privilege to watch twice a week every week for the next at least five weeks so do with that what you will I just want you to be aware of how amazing that is and not be aware of how my voice sounds right now. Holy buckets. Holy buckets. All right. Dr. Pepper break. Okay. We continue on. Leanne Williamson, also in this ticker. Leanne Williamson uh, notched her 200th win on October 5th. Congrats to Leanne for that. Um First of all, that's an incredible milestone. <laughs> and I think that we don't often see longevity in sports. My dog, I hope you can't hear that. My dog is in my office and she is currently scratching her back on my futon. Okay, I think she's done. Um, <laughs> Leanne, I'm sorry that Sadie Kay decided to interrupt my my homage to you. Um, but we don't often see longevity in sports, and we see lots of coaches move around. I think that's less common in volleyball, um, but I just think that we're so fortunate as fans to have people like Coach Williamson, who's you know been with USD in a head coaching role um, since 2014. So congratulations on your 200th win. We're going to move on to Kansas City, and as I do that, 
Coach Christy Posey also got her 200th win, I believe, on October 7th. Um, she's been with Kansas City. This is her 13th season. Um, so 13 years at the end of this year. She'll also have coached like 370-ish matches by the end of this season, which is also an incredible milestone. So snaps and claps for Christy Posey as well. Um, Kansas City is 7-1. and one. Their only loss came in five sets to Denver, I believe, a couple of weeks ago. Um, last week, they swept St. Thomas. They had an epic five-set battle with South Dakota. In the last two matches, Odyssey Warren has hammered 30 kills, which is ridiculous. Um, Sydney Henry, 86 assists. So that tells you just how much attacking is going on for Kansas City. And Mackenzie Moberg, a name that we've not said a ton actually at all. I don't think her name has ever left my mouth. Um, Mackenzie Moberg had 32 digs over the past two matches, which is phenomenal. Um, also, Sila Ozurik, who is from Turkey, had nine kills in the USD match and then three extremely timely blocks in the St. Thomas match. So we'd love to see her also getting in and getting some action. Like I said, winning by committee, Kansas City is one of those teams. Um and I think that if – here's how to tell if a team is, like, a win-by-committee team. If you – first of all, like, you'd have to watch a lot of volleyball. Um, but even if you watch a reasonable, casual amount of volleyball and you can name more than, like, two players on a team that's not your own team, that's a win-by-committee team. If you know people's names, like, the amount of Kansas City names I've said, the amount of North Dakota names I've said – the amount of North Dakota State names I said, those are win by committee teams. And Kansas City is certainly one of those. Um, sitting second in the league right now. And finally, 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 we come to our other rivalry match of the week between North Dakota, who's two and six, and North Dakota State, who is four and four. We will start with the Fighting Hawks. Um, Paige Barber had eight kills, Marissa Stockman, seven kills, four blocks, and Elizabeth Norris, 12 assists, nine digs, just shy of a double-double. Elizabeth Norris is one of those players who, like, might not necessarily show up in every stat line, but shows up in every stat line. Like, is the reason for the success of the team. She's everywhere. Um... Oh my gosh, what was that tweet? The UND Twitter account, who I've told you is has been fire all season, said something like, when Elizabeth Norris swims, she doesn't get wet, the water gets Elizabeth Norris <laughs> or something. I don't know. I thought it was funny. Anyways, moving on to NDSU, Allie Hinsey in literally every stat line but one. <laughs> Ten kills, seven blocks, two assists, two aces. Lauren Jansen had eight kills, Alexis Bowling who is my freaking idol, had seven kills. Um, and then we need to talk about Kelly Johnson. You're going to hear this in the interview uh, with J-Lo later. But Kelly Johnson reached 1,000 digs last week, making her the third player in the Division One era for North Dakota State to hit 3,000 assists and 1,000 digs. Two others. Brianna Rasmussen, six-ish years ago, 2016, 2017, something like that. Um, and coach Jennifer Lopez in 2011. So pretty cool for Kelly Johnson to, um, to, to reach that milestone. I also, I can't believe I didn't ask, like we talked about Kelly Johnson, but uh, this question came to me when I was writing my notes up for the commentary part of the episode. And I was like, why did I not ask JLo how like rewarding it is or how she feels about watching her own player reach a milestone that she reached? Why I didn't ask that question, I don't know. Hindsight's 2020, but I would imagine that that's a pretty rewarding situation um, and a pretty awesome experience. So, again, I feel like Kelly Johnson is one of those generational type players that you don't really know what you have um, until it's gone. So, that is all of the gabbing that I have for you before I preview matches. Um, which is my least favorite part. So I'm going to take a break and let you listen slash watch these interviews. Um, listen if you're doing audio version and watch if you're watching me stare at my camera right now. So we are going to drop 
in JLo first from North Dakota State. And then after that, there will be like a seven second awkward transition with a tad bit of, of driving music. And then you will see Coach Chang Pham's face pop up on the screen and you'll get to um, listen to him and, and his perspective on how everything is going. And then I'll be back to preview your matches. So I will see you in a bit. All right, welcome back to another seventh rotation sit down, this time with North Dakota State coach Jen Lopez. Coach, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Madison. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've been so excited about this one, especially the way the Bison are playing right now. So I'm stoked. You guys are sitting at 500, four wins, four losses, and we're just going to jump right in. So all of the conference losses this year, except for the early loss to DU, which I think was just an outlier, your other three conference losses have been in five sets. So talk to me a little bit just about like the tenacity of your team and how you've been able to be so persistent. You know, I think the biggest thing is it's kind of been a challenge of us all year is to um, do our best, play hard, and then just keep going. And I think with what our conference is doing and how overall how the conference is playing, it's anybody's game on any given night. And I think you're able you're seeing that a lot as you have teams winning or pushing teams to extra sets um, than what we've seen in previous years, which I think is a really good thing for what the Summit League is doing. But you know, it's it's shown some grit from our, our squad to be able to continue to push five sets. Um, and we have had some um, losses along the way in those moments. But I think it continues to show ourselves that we are in those games and now it's just about finishing. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like everybody's playing five sets. There's at least one every night, if not two or, or three. Um this is partially a question that's from a listener, but also partially from me. We kind of had the same question. Um, so Troy had brought up to me how you had one of the best offenses in the league last year. And I was like, yeah, I was kind of thinking about how Syra Tanshin was here last year. And I kind of don't notice that she's gone um, because you're still really good. <laughs> so like, how have you been able to continue to be so explosive and still have such a, a high caliber offense? You know, I think, Kudos to last year's team. Syra did some really good things and Michelle to kind of be able to balance out that offense along with Allie Hinsey. And I think knowing what we were losing and how many points we were losing off of out of our offense from last season, I think we really went into our training in the spring, knowing we needed to continue to develop and kind of find that balance of what those points needed to be. Um, and I think we've had a lot of kids, whether they're newcomers or kind of stepping up into some of their roles, I think they've been, really been able to find some of that success on offense still, which I think has made some things pretty fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is solely Troy's question. So he wants to know, going back to the old NCC days, which I think we all like to talk about a lot. Um, <laughs> Omaha and NDSU were really dominant teams then. So kind of twofold. Do people still reminisce on that and like bring that up to you? And then also how does your own history with the team or with the program kind of drive you? You know, I think for those that I talk to about those matches against Omaha um, in those days, the division two days, their memories are very fond. And so the, some of their best games were playing against Omaha and some of the rivalry matches and wins and losses that kind of came with it. Um, so it's kind of fun talking with them about it, being able to kind of see that different side. I think more so now the dynamic of what the Summit League is, even when I played, was a lot different. We have a, a probably half the teams within our conference right now, I wasn't playing against even as a player too. And so to kind of see it from a different perspective and kind of gain that traction again, you hear the memories, you hear the stories, and now kind of being able to put it into our own way of play has been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that something doing this, like an, even in basketball too, everyone talks about the NCC. And it took me, I mean, that was before me. So it took me a while to like, even know what that was. Um, but now it's everyone's favorite topic. So I thought it was a good question. Um, fourth question is actually just a statement. Kelly Johnson. I mean, I don't think that people realize the like caliber of player that we're dealing with. There are three people in NDSU's history to have, um, what is it? 3000 assists and, and a thousand digs. One of them I'm staring at right now. <laughs> the second one was Brianna Rasmussen and the third one is Kelly Johnson. So just talk to me about 
her and her impact on the program? You know, Kel's done a phenomenal job throughout her career. And I think the biggest thing about her is she's continuing to push herself to get better. And I think that's a, it's a tough feat to ask. You know, you kind of get to that point in your career when you get some things figured out. And I think for her, she's just never satisfied. And I think that's really allowed her to continue to grow. Um, it's allowed others to get better around her. And she's kind of making that impact in her way, which I think is awesome and really excited and proud of what she's been able to do because it's a tough role to be in um, and play and kind of be at that point of your career where you're still striving to be better um, and understand that you haven't quite figured everything out yet, but be okay with that. Um, but I think she, you know, she keeps pushing, she keeps pushing herself. And I think in turn for others to see that, um, knows that regardless of what's going on, they can keep going too. Yeah. She's one of those players for me that you often see her like dancing during a timeout or what, you know, the camera will catch her just like having a good time. Um, so you can tell that she's, she's happy and she's fun to watch. She is. Um, my last serious question for you that was planned, I guess, if I don't come up with another one, I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about the league in general. Um, you have a three match week coming up this week. I think over half the teams do not all of them do. Um, but in addition to that, just in the future, what challenges do you see for the rest of the the conference season? Yeah, I think going into this week, um, it's tough for everybody. So everybody's kind of coming into this week with the same mindset of how we grind it through. Um, playing on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. I believe there's only three teams that don't have that, um, where yeah. they get some of those days off, obviously, with just matches, matchups, and everything else, too. Um, but I do think it creates it creates a level of um, focus and preparation where you kind of got to get to this point, and you got to find a way to fight. And there's no easy way to go about it. I, I know for my program, we're fortunate that we are home for these three, but that's not everybody um, where they're either home for one game and then they're on the road for two or vice versa. And I think that raises its own set of challenges too. But I think, you know, the biggest thing we talk about with our team and whatever boat we're in is how you kind of take these moments and challenges and how do you overcome them and not use, find a way to, for it to be a disadvantage to you. And I think that's the easy easy way to go about it. Um, but really to be able to embrace the moment um, and play against some really good competition, knowing you got to get through it and you still got to be able to give it your all. So you got to show up every single day. There's no off day. Um, and you just kind of got to kind of got to grind it out a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Um, opportunity again to, to, you know, hopefully be Oral Roberts again, but at the same time, Oral Roberts has definitely shown some talent and some improvement just in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then Denver coming to the Benson bunker as well. So, all right. Fun questions for you. Um, who's a player on another team that you love to watch? Oh, and how about in the league and out of the league? Okay. You know, I think I'm so focused on what's going on in the summit league that I'm just going to stick to that one. Okay. That's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Spent. Um, but I, Mm, good question. Or five, if you can't pick one. You know, <laughs> I've been really impressed with, um, honestly, what Harms is doing at South Dakota. I think to have gone through her career again, starting it as a freshman and continuing to challenge and push and play at the level that she is, I think is a huge kudos to her. Um, going through different setters, going through different personnel and still being able to produce the same thing day in and day out, I think is she's, she's just fun to watch, whether it's from the block, whether it's from her offense, offensive production. I think she's one that, you know, how can I keep learning as a coach to either play against a player like that or learn to develop our kids that have some of those intangibles too. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't know if you remember, but um, last week, the stat that she reached was at 600 blocks. Yeah, I think. And the last the Summit League tweeted and I replied to them and I said, who who was the other one? Because there was only one other. And um, I don't know, her name was Kathy something from Buffalo, who's not even in the league. Yeah. Anymore. They're in the back now. 
1997 when I was four months old. <laughs> like just that, that just derailed me like incredible. Yeah. So great answer. Um, who is kind of the class clown in the locker room? That we have a couple, honestly, we have some really like bright personalities and it is, it makes it so much fun and enjoyable to be around. Uh, but honestly, they all kind of have it in their own way, but you mentioned Kelly Johnson. She definitely brings that side out of a lot of people. Um, and Morgan Middleton, those are the two that, that have some fun. They like to joke around, but, at, but still can like have that balance between that friendship relationship and they kind of go about it in the right way, but it's fun to see. And they create just um, a different environment, which can kind of catch you off guard at sometimes, but also in a really good way. <laughs> what about on the coaching staff? Who's the, who's the clown on the coaching staff? Oh, well, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say um, coach Drew. So Drew Davis for me probably is. He's a good Twitter follow listeners. If you're not following Drew Davis, yeah. he's a good follow. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> what song would get you in the locker room dance circle? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Even lie. my team knows about me. I won't lie, but we've <laughs> talked about this. Jenny from the block will do it. <laughs> I was hoping. I was like, if it's not J-Lo for J-Lo, then what are we even doing here? <laughs> um, what has been a memorable moment for you this season? <sighs> You know, it's not even really wins and losses or moments that kind of come through. You know, I think the biggest and most memorable is when you get kids that that don't see the court, some of your bench players, and they're able to come in and they do something really awesome. We had a moment last night where we were able to get one of our seniors in. She came in and served really well, Alex Lyle put some points together. She got a defensive stop. And then her next point up, she's getting an ace from her serve. And the reaction that our team has for that and how they rally around every single person, I think it's those things that truly define a team. And regardless of who the player is, how they keep going and how they kind of create that trust and have your back mentality through it all. And she's the first one on the bench giving feedback, cheering everybody else on. But for her to be able to have her own moment, I think was really, really special. That's awesome. So awesome to hear. Um, all right. That's all I have for you. So thanks so much for coming back again. We really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you having me on. This is a lot better than just a phone call. <laughs> oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I like that. Um, for the listener, upcoming matches for NDSU against ORU tonight, I believe Pink Night, correct? It is. It is. Yeah, pink night. Um, 7 p.m. Central on WDAY and the Summit League Network, and then a morning match on Saturday with Denver at 11 on the Summit League Network. And we will be back after this. All right, listeners, welcome back to the second half of your double feature today, um, this time with St. Thomas head coach Tang Pham. Coach, thanks so much for joining us again this season. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Tommies are one and seven in league play after an epic reverse sweep over NDSU. And that's where um, I want to start today. So the first set of that NDSU match, I think, went like 30 to 28 um, and went NDSU's way. But your group kind of battled through with something like 60 plus kills in that match. So talk to me just about how steady your offense was that night. Um, it started off with really good passing and, you know, uh, NDSU is a, a tough out for us. And, and that was actually the first time we actually, you know, beat them in any sets in, in our history here. So, to, uh, for our girls to overcome that and it gave them a lot of confidence, like, like having a two point set, knowing that, okay, we can compete with this team and then being able to push through. I think that was huge for our program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kind of speaking of that, I guess I'm going to jumble up my questions here, but something like 15 of the 20 players on your roster are freshmen or sophomores. Um, what kind of like experience are they getting and how do you see that kind of materializing in the future? Um, right now, as our opponents can, can confirm, we're making a lot of silly um, freshman mistakes, but that's just because we have freshmen. 
Um, I do feel as if as our team matures and we clean up parts of our game, we'll be able to contend a, a, in more matches. Um, it's been a learning curve for us. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just necessary as we transition from D3 to D1 that as we get in different athletes, that at some point we're going to be young and hopefully at some point we're going to be a mature team. Yeah, absolutely. You're like totally throwing me off because that was my next question uh, was about the transition. So a question from our listener, Troy, he wants to know, it's not obviously easy to come out and win, but we've seen the Tommies kind of contend, even if the record doesn't really show it. Um, So what is your message to anyone who, you know, fans or whoever that might be a little bit impatient um, with what the record looks like right now? Well, uh, what people don't understand is, uh, again, um, it's a transition period where um, every Division One team that we're up against has 12 scholarship athletes. And as we grow into our process, we'll grow into 12 scholarships. So as we get more athletes in, we should be more competitive. Uh, I'd ask that the, you know, the impatient fans give us a little grace, be a little patient. Uh, the girls are working their tails off and I couldn't be more proud of this group. Uh, again, we have uh, a young group that is learning a lot and figuring out what it takes to win. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of young, talk to me a little bit about Ella Vogel and just her impact on the team thus far. Oh, Ella's been a stud for us. Um, we just got done with a, a tough match with the UMKC last night, and she was the shining star there. She came up with a lot of great digs and and what she has to say and when she says it to the team in terms of messaging and you know, has been uh, on point. Um, we've known Ella since she's 13 years old. Uh, she lives in our neighborhood, my neighborhood personally. And so it's been super fun to kind of watch her grow into this role and become the player that she's becoming. Um, great leader, great ball player, couldn't say enough good things about her. Yeah, awesome. We love to hear that. Um, I believe you are one of the teams who is suffering from a three match week this week there's only a few teams that are not so what's kind of your uh, you like you mentioned you played Kansas City last night you have to play SDSU on Thursday who nearly beat USD and then following up with Omaha who's in first place so what's kind of your message to the team you know during this time uh it's five matches in nine days uh we're just gonna play the hand that we're dealt you know and again uh, the messaging is that we are resilient we can overcome adversity uh a, with again our transition period that that we are not allowed to participate in the postseason conference right now uh, if we were able to qualify it kind of puts us in a good spot of okay this could be the toughest week that we face let's figure out how to do it right and then when it matters hopefully it will matter yeah for sure do you feel like you had any non-conference matches um like if i were to pick someone out it, it would probably be illinois chicago that kind of prepared you for the the caliber of the summit league this year because it does seem like the league is very this is not how i thought the standings were going to look at this point <laughs> it's very up and down well i i honestly believe that the summit league um is a league where anyone can win on any night um i do feel that that you know two players if they're on or off either way make the difference in the match um i think that it's a well-coached league so again it, it becomes even harder but uh the the uic match definitely showed us what we were capable of doing. Um, since that time, however, you know, we've lost three, three uh, starters from that lineup to what we're currently using now. And, you know, that's just part of the game, part of the, part of uh, the nature of sports and, and we're overcoming that. And I think that uh, it's taken us a little while to find our groove again, but once we hit it, we'll be good. Yeah, I believe it. Anyone that, that doesn't think, um, that this is a productive team is out of their mind because if I think in two years, I'm going to be so shocked. I can't wait to see, to see what's going to happen. Um, all right. We're going to move into some of the not so serious questions. So I want to know who is a player on another team, um, in the league that you just love to watch that just blows you away. Uh, I mean, there's just so many, uh, you could, you can go up and down the list. Uh, you know, I, I take uh, appreciation from everybody, uh, but uh, Ali Hinsey, number seven from uh, North Dakota State, is is a player that, you know, she, if you actually watch her game, she sets, she plays left back, she plays uh, right back, she hits outside, but then comes in on quicks. Like, she's so dynamic and, and such a great player that, that she's one of my favorites in the league to watch. 
Love that. I, that's an answer I haven't heard from a coach yet. So I like hearing all these other names. Um, what is a non-conference road trip that you enjoyed the most this season and why? Um, actually, it was actually our own home tournament. Um, we were able to host this year and we had Montana State, Cal Baptist, and UW-Milwaukee come in. Um, we've never hosted a Division One tournament and it, it went off uh, without a hitch. Um, just being home a little bit more than we have been on the road, I think kind of helps the team morale and, and it helps the, the kids get back into school and, and just in the groove of things. So that was probably my favorite week of the non-conference so far. Awesome. Uh, my last question for you is a little bit sappy, but you, I don't know, listeners, if you don't know, um, Coach Fam coached his 650th match this season um, on September 29th. So what changes have you seen in yourself over, you know, the 21 years that you've been at St. Thomas and the years that you were at Augsburg before that? And what are you most proud of as you hit this milestone in your career? Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, I think that the the being a lifelong learner, I've learned more about myself in the last three years than I probably did in the first 18 of coaching. Um, I think that with the division one model and how much time you're allotted to spend with your athletes, it does get, uh, does allow you to let them know, get to know them on a different level. At the same time, they get to know you on a different level. So there's going to be times of frustration and times of sadness and times of joy and just allowing it to be a human experience where, where we allow all that to happen has been really cool for me to watch. Um, we haven't had our, our first division one class go through all four years quite yet, but I imagine when that happens, that's going to hit me pretty hard in terms of, okay, these are the young ladies that decided to gut it out with us for, for this amount of time. And, and again, um, I couldn't be more proud of the, the type of athletes that we're producing. Uh, I know the wins and losses haven't been there in the, in the last three seasons, but uh, I know that I'm stubborn enough that they're going to come. And I know that our team's working hard enough that it's going to come. It's again, going to be a process. And as long as we focus on the right things, we'll be okay. Absolutely. Great answer. Couldn't have been better. Um, the Tommies will travel to SDSU on Thursday and Omaha on Saturday. You can catch both of those on the Summit League Network. Coach, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to a, a, a future meetings and, and hopefully getting to interact with fans a little bit more. Welcome back. Welcome back. I hope that you enjoyed those interviews. I absolutely love it. It's my favorite part of this. Um, I think that if I had a co-host, I would enjoy like this part a little bit more. Um, but I love getting to talk to coaches and just get their perspective and also being able to provide an outlet where like we can still be serious, but we can also just talk about volleyball um, instead of, you know, like all of the pressure. I don't know. I don't think I ask super pressing questions. Maybe I do. I don't know. I don't think so. But anyways, um, super fun to get to talk to them. That's also the first time that I've gotten to talk to Coach Fam. Um, if you remember last year, my former co-host did that interview by themselves uh, because I um, – was in Missouri with my family and wasn't able to attend that interview. So right as we got on the call, I was like, you know what? I don't think that I've actually ever spoken to you before. <laughs> so that was uh, fun. And of course, it was fun to be able to talk to JLo again. It's also so much fun to call her JLo. She's the greatest. All right. Let's talk about what is happening tonight. All of these times are local, central time, and all of these will be on the Summit League Network. I believe the NDSU match will also be on WDAY if you are um, in the Fargo area. So at 6 p.m., we have Omaha at USD. What's going to happen? I don't have a damn clue. Um, I think I'm going to go... It's. I feel like I want to say Omaha 3-2, to two. But I feel like it's such a cop out to say like, oh, yeah, it's going to go five cents. Like, I don't say that because I don't know. I say that because I genuinely think the way that Omaha is playing, I think they come out with the win. But the way that USD is playing, I think that they can push Omaha. So I'm going to say Omaha three to one. Yeah, that's that's what I'm going to say there. Um, Oral Roberts at NDSU at 7 p.m. NDSU three to one, I think. I think that Oral Roberts... Uh, we'll push them a little bit, but I don't think it'll be enough. 
to get the win. Um, St. Thomas at SDSU. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know. The last time these two played each other, SDSU got out of there with a win, I think, three to nothing. Might have been three to one. Um, But St. Thomas pushed them in every single set. I think I'm going to go St. Thomas this time. Does SDSU have another five-set match in them? Does St. Thomas have another five-set match in them? I'm going to say St. Thomas three to two. And DU at UND. Oh, boy. DU didn't play on Tuesday, so they've had more rest. That being said, I think that UND is going to be fired up after their loss to NDSU because they should have... They should have performed better than they did. I hope you're enjoying listening to me, watching me stare at my computer screen right now. Um, I think that I'm going to go UAE. Is that hopeful to go UND 3-1? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go UND 3-1. That's what I'm going to do. Um, Troy Gillespie can play devil's advocate as soon as he watches this. I know he's going to be like, here's your predictions and here's mine. And they're the exact opposite. And you know what? Half the time, half the time he's right. <laughs> so I guess we'll see what happens. Um, all right. That's tonight. Saturday. Denver at NDSU. See, these ones I'm not really going to predict as solidly because I need to know what happens tonight to make like an informed decision. Um, Saturday, Denver at NDSU at 11 a.m. Based on what I know right now, I think NDSU probably three to one, but we'll see. Um, Oral Roberts at North Dakota at 12. Based on what I know right now, I think that Oral Roberts maybe beats UND on Saturday. Kansas City at SDSU, Kansas City three to one. Um, that game at 1 p.m. And then St. Thomas at Omaha at 5 p.m. Probably 3 to nothing, Omaha. Maybe 3 to 1. Then again, we'll see. The only one I feel really confident about is Kansas City just because of the way they're playing. But then at the same time, see, I say I'm really confident. Then I'm like, I don't know. SDSU just played really well against USD. I will say, I don't think that SDSU is as consistent as Kansas City. SDSU will have a good match and then a not-so-great match. Um, and Kansas City is just hammering them out right now. So that's how I feel. That's what I think. That's what I have. Um, do you want to be on a podcast? Because, like, doing this by myself is okay. It's not great. I don't love it. I mean, I, I do. Like, I of course, I love it. I do it because I love it. But, like, I don't love not having anyone to shut me up. I feel like you guys probably just, like, listen to find out who the interviews are and then you skip to the interviews which is fine like I'm not offended um but yeah if you like want to hop on for an episode if you like know anything about summit league volleyball like quite literally anything and you're like a good banter partner and you think that we would vibe well dm me I would love to have you um that's my shameless plug for for this episode so just kidding. I actually have one more shameless plug. You've heard me talk about her turn in South Dakota before that was started by Maya Sellen and Tori Nelson. Um, they tweeted yesterday that they actually doubled the number of scholarships this year. Um, they were able to offer 18 scholarships to girls in the Brookings area to attend South Dakota State athletic camps. Um, and they added, I think they previously did volleyball, basketball, and soccer, and they added softball this year. Um, and eight of those 18 scholarships this summer were for volleyball. So I just think that's super cool. Again, if that's something you want to contribute to, I would absolutely encourage you to do that um, and provide those opportunities for young girls in, in the Brookings area. Last summer, nine scholarships. This summer, 18. So super incredible. And I love that the eight of them were volleyball. That just honestly makes me so happy. So cool beans. I will gab at you later. Go watch Summit League Volleyball tonight. Go watch Summit League Volleyball tonight. And don't forget to stay on the summit. Deuces.